Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, those of you who don't know, my name is uh, Lord Elton. I'm the Bronze Laurel Historian, uh, which means I'm the official historian of the Laurel Bronze, which means everything I say is absolutely true. <laughs> uh, I always, uh, those of you who have seen it before know this, I always say from the very beginning, uh, whenever I start my, uh, my lectures, uh, that uh, as I go on, uh, please don't snort. <laughs> you might wake up the person next to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, this is uh, this is a lecture that's called uh, "Lungs for the City: The Creation of the Bronx Park System." And one of the reasons why I'm talking about it is because here we are in the year uh, uh, 2013, and it is the 125th anniversary of the creation. Park system. Mm -hmm. So it's because of that we're talking about this. All right, so today New York City's Borough of the Bronx boasts of having 25%, 25 percent, 25 percent of its land mass in parkland. That is the largest proportion of parkland of any borough. In the beginning of the process that led to the accumulation of such a large amount of recreation space, that is rooted in the 1880s. The result came largely from the efforts of one man. His name was John Mulally. Who, who was John Mulally? Mulally was born in 1835 in Belfast, in the northern part of Ireland. Despite being in the mostly Protestant area of the country, he was a steadfast Roman Catholic. He came to the United States as a young man, uh, becoming a special correspondent for the New York Herald. From 1857 to 1858, he reported on the laying of the first transatlantic cable. Following that, he served as secretary to the artist and inventor Samuel F. B. Morse. During the early years of the Civil War, he was the editor of the Metropolitan Record, the official newspaper of the Archdiocese of New York. He later worked for the New York Tribune and the New York Evening Post. After he became politically prominent, in large part because of his efforts on behalf of parks, he served as New York City's Commissioner of Health and two terms as a member of the city's Board of Tax Assessors. He died in 1911. In 1874, New York City expanded its borders beyond Manhattan for the first time. The towns of Morrisania, West Farms and Kings Bridge, all on the mainland west of the Bronx River, uh, was annexed to New York City. The mainland area was called the annexed district. Despite the fact that the acquisition doubled the geographic size of New York City, most city officials never gave it another thought. For many of the succeeding decades, the annexed district remains unimproved and neglected by the municipal authorities. One of the main reasons was the density of population. At the time of annexation, Manhattan alone had one million inhabitants. The annexed district had less than half of that. Most of the city's mainland area was still filled with farms and scattered small suburban villages occasionally got in the landscapes. Wealthy New Yorkers had already erected mansions in Riverdale and along the heights of the Harlem River. Hunts Point was the home of some of the wealthiest industrialists and financiers who lived on their estates there. Most of them valued the countryside and used the area as a quiet retreat from Manhattan's noise, crowds, chaotic traffic, pollution, and the pressures of the high state businesses that they were in. Farmers on the mainland raised fruits, vegetables, and livestock to sell in markets in Manhattan. Villagers on the general neighborhood groceries, haberdashers, dress, dress shops, and hardware stores, and found entertainment in local German beer gardens 
or attended occasional dances or concerts in, in a local catering hall. For recreation, they shot birds in the Manicay woods every morning. Uh, went swimming in local swimming holes, uh, which were used as skating rinks in winter. Or communed with nature by walking along the dirt roads, admiring wildflowers and landscapes on the farmland. Public parks was a relatively new idea. Before parks were created, many walked and picnicked in local cemeteries. Nobody there objected. <laughs> uh, there were small parks in Manhattan, such as Bowling Green. The idea for Central Park, an artificially landscaped creation in the middle of Manhattan, was the first large project of its kind in the city and it cost an enormous sum of money to complete. With the city polluted by industrial smokestacks belching forth sooty air into the atmosphere, it was realized that parks had another use besides a place for recreation. Trees and plants thrived on absorbing the huge amounts of carbon dioxide emitted by industry. In turn, they gave forth pure oxygen that replenished the atmosphere and provided the main ingredient for the air that people breathe. It was for this reason that parkland came to be called lungs for the city. These conditions were among the many issues discussed by residents when the city annexed part of the mainland in 1874. John Mullaly turned his attention to conditions in the sparsely populated mainland and contrasted them with conditions in overcrowded Manhattan. He realized that in the annexation, the city had the possibility of solving some of its current problems and heading off some problems that might arise in the future. Mullaney saw parks as important for improving the sanitary welfare of the people and for giving them opportunities for physical recreation and out of door exercise. He also saw parks adding to the prosperity of the city and is a major element in making it a metropolis for culture, magnificence, and power worthy of being the le leading city in the world in the rapidly approaching 20th century. In the late 1870s, Lenny began collecting information and statistics bearing on the usefulness and the establishment of public parks. By early 1881, he concluded that the number of public parks was inadequate for the current and future needs of the city's population. Moreover, he discovered that several American and European cities had already acquired more, more parkland than New York City had at the time. Anticipating the argument that acquiring new parks would be too expensive for the city to afford, Blaney delved into the financial statistics. He discovered that the creation of Central Park despite its great expense, increased the value of the surrounding real estate by $2 million more than if the park had never been built. Mullaley concluded that through the increase in real estate values, new parks would generate a profit for the city, not a loss. Mullaley began to generate interest in his ideas by writing columns on the subject for the New York Herald. In those columns, he called attention to the wide open spaces for parkland that existed in the annexed district, and also in the nearby portions of what was still Westchester County, east of the Bronx River. He stated his reasons for the idea of placing new parks there, cited statistics, and produced maps of prospective purchases. In the course of his investigation, Mullaley met Joseph S. Wood, who became interested in the project. When Mullaley said that he would like to organize a movement to achieve his object, Wood immediately volunteered his services. Wood obtained the cooperation of several gentlemen in the city to call a meeting on November 26, 1881 at the Fifth Avenue Hotel. There they formed the New York Park Association. Waldo Hutchins was chosen as its president. Hutchins, a lawyer and congressman, owned an estate on a steep slope, slope found between today's Riverdale Avenue and Irwin Avenue 
uh, between 246th Street and Dash Place. Now, if you go there today, one of the streets in that area is called Waldo Avenue. So if anybody asks, you could always, uh, uh, you could always answer the question, where's Waldo? Okay. Uh, uh, Luther R. Marsh, one of the city's leading lawyers and great legal minds, uh, became the vice president. William W. Niles, another lawyer, served as treasurer. Niles owned an estate near modern Marshall Parkway and Van Cortlandt Avenue East, in short, just about this area. Uh, he later served as president of the Bronx River Parkway Commission. Mullaney himself was chosen to be the group secretary. The members of the Park Association's board included uh, Henry Claffin, who owned an estate west of the uh, of today's as west and south of today's Jerome Park Reservoir. Uh, William Caldwell, the leading figure in Morrisania, uh, who at various times served as a New York State Senator and as the defunct town's supervisor, and was now the owner of the Sunday newspaper. Uh, Gustav Schwab, a German immigrant businessman who owned the land where the southern portion of today's Bronx Community College campuses today. Uh, Lewis G. Morris, whose estate gave its name to Morris Heights. Franklin Edson, who later was to serve as New York City's mayor from 1883 to 1885, or 1884. Uh, Leonard W. Jerome, who owned the Jerome Park racetrack and whose daughter became the mother of Winston Churchill. Uh, Jordan L. Mott, leading iron founder and inventor of the coal burning stove, who made Mott Haven an early form of an industrial park. And, now oh, you're going to love this name, General Edberg Ludovicus Beal. He was the army engineer who laid out Central Park following the plans of the Homestead and Hawks. These and other board members were well acquainted with New York City's political, economic, and social elite, and they had gained great publicity for the cause. With Mullaly as secretary, the Park Association printed copies of their proposals and gave them to clergymen and leaders in business, government, and society. They also sought publicity in the daily newspapers. What? Well, tell me that's the downfall of the Bronx. Alright. Let me get there. Sooner or later, probably later. Uh, can't tell the Bronx what That's a minor tell. So the movement uh, began to attract increasing support. In 1882, the members of the Park Association leadership, including Mullaley, tried to get the New York State Legislature to pass two bills that they had drafted. One would provide for the purchase of Van Cortland Park. The other would create a commission to select sites for new public parks on the mainland and report back to the legislature. In the proposal was the intention to place one park on Long Island Sound, even though that territory was not yet included within the boundaries of the city of New York. The proposal also looked towards the creation of several parkways to connect the parks. However, the proposed legislation never got out of committee. And the, number, and the members of the Park Association decided to withdraw it from consideration and postpone the matter until the following legislative session. Suddenly, and without warning, just before the legislature adjourned, a proposal introduced by anti-Tammany Reform Democrat Matthew P. Breen passed the legislature. 
He had appointed the city's mayor, commissioner of public works, the president of the board of aldermen, and the president of the tax department as a commission to report within 30 days on the advisability of public parks in the next district and the adjacent areas of Westchester County. They were also to select sites for the parks. Although Mullaley and the members of the Park Association opposed the resolution on the grounds that it did not provide enough time to thoroughly examine the subject, they used the three public hearings held in March of 1883 to again publicize the positive effects such parks would have. Sure enough, the commission reported back to the legislature that it did not have enough time to adequately do the job. When the new legislature met in April 1883, the Park Association prevailed upon Assemblyman Leroy B. Crane to introduce a new bill that did pass. The law empowered the mayor, with the consent of the Board of Order, to appoint a seven-man commission to select sites for public parks on the mainland. The mayor at that time was Franklin Edson, one of the original board members of the Park Association. The seven men he appointed were all prominent members of the association and had been advocating the creation of new parks for the past two years. <laughs> Critically, one of them was the brilliant lawyer Luther R. Marsh. The members of the new commission appointed John Mullaney as its secretary. As such, he would, he would really run the day-to-day -day affairs of the commission take care of all of the details. Only 25 days after they were appointed, the members of the commission inspected the sites of each of the proposed parks. Starting in June 1883, the commission recessed for the summer, but John Mullaley never ceased his activities. He wrote extensively to park officials in many European and American cities to gather information and statistics relating to the establishment, cost, and upkeep of parks. When the commission reassembled in the autumn, Mullaley placed his accumulated data at the, at the disposal of the members. The commission then held a series of public hearings. Those who attended and spoke were almost, almost unanimously in favor of the idea of establishing new parks on the mainland. There was some disagreement over whether to, to create a few large parks or a larger number of smaller parks throughout the district. Others advocated slightly different boundaries for the proposed parks. After the hearings, the commission turned its attention to writing its report to the legislature. Most of the work was done by Mullaley. The report was 217 pages long. It described and illustrated the sites and included more facts, detail, and statistics, and the map. The commission's report and draft bill, written by Luther R. Marsh, were placed in the hands of the legislature in January 1884. George Washington Puckett, Tammany Stallworth, who represented the annexed district and much of Manhattan north of 59th Street in the state senate, and Assemblyman Walter Howe introduced the bill to acquire parklands in their respective houses. It was at this time that the movement to create parks for the city on the mainland began to experience serious opposition. It first arose from a most unexpected quarter. Mayor Franklin Edson now turned against the implementation of the idea he initially espoused. He opposed the commission's report and the bill in the legislature. He objected first to the location, extent, and expense of the proposed parks. He also demanded that the lands acquired that were located within the bounds of the city be first approved by the city authorities and the sinking fund commissioners. Uh, the sinking fund commissioners issued city bonds and redeemed the public debt. The plan's opponents alleged that the members of the commission and of the Park Association had a financial interest in the passage of the scheme. 
they pointed, for instance, to Waldo Hutchins, uh, the value of whose lands would be enhanced by its proximity to the new Vancouver Park. Uh, they pointed to William W. Niles, uh, whose home abutted the planned Marshall Parkway. Edson's new position was vehemently opposed by the New York City press and by several of the prominent citizens of the metropolis. Their numbers included such prominent New Yorkers as August Belmont, railroad magnate Sidney Dillon, John Jacob Astor, Republican political heavyweight Chauncey M. Depew, and Elliot Roosevelt, the brother of Theodore Roosevelt and father of Eleanor Roosevelt. They supported the Parks idea. Many of these and other prominent New Yorkers were urged to action by letters sent to them by Luther R. Marsh. They rallied in support of the legislature as the contest moved to the floor of the state senate. Mullaly and others spoke and wrote to the legislatures to set the record straight. They argued that only land most appropriate for parkland would be taken. <clears throat> A major consideration was that each of the parks has a natural has natural landscaping. Therefore, the enormous expense of landscaping huge tracts, such as happened with Central Park, would be avoided on the mainland since nature itself provided the landscape already in place. Mullally also insisted that the proponents of the new parks were all public spirited men who did not look to enhance the value of their own lands. Indeed, Mullally pointed out there were several residents whose land was taken for parks that still opposed the creation of the parkland, even though they would be paid a substantial sum for their land. Others who were not members of the parks movement uh, tried to get the parks boundaries altered so that their lands would be closer to the parks and thus increase in value. <clears throat> Mullaly insisted those people did not have a public interest in mind, and their desire was true venality. Thus to say that the park's proponents wanted to establish the parks just to enhance their own property values was absurd. As a result, the vote in the state senate produced a total of 21 to 2 in favor of the parks bill. The matter then went to the consideration of the assembly. In that body, body one of the most vehement opponents of the park bill was the Republican chairman of the committee. Does anybody know the name of the Republican chairman of the committee on parks? Bloomberg. No. What year was it? Theodore Roosevelt. He opposed the parks bill. All right. Shocking, isn't it? Okay. Um, Roosevelt contended that new parks would do the most good if they were placed in the most overcrowded sections of the city, such as the Lower East Side, rather than in the wilds of the mainland where very few people would have access to them. Mullaly and his allies countered this argument by pointing out that the cost of buying parkland in the city's overcrowded areas was much higher than the cost of land in the more sparsely inhabited mainland. Moreover, parks in the crowded areas would necessarily be very small and would help very few people, where the mainland parks would be large. In addition, it was expected that more and more people would eventually settle in the next district, thus increasing the value of the land. If the city waited for that to happen, it could not afford the purchase of the land and create great parks. Uh, that the commissioners and had projected. Not only did other members of the Assembly's Committee on Cities all reject Roosevelt's position and vote to report the bill to the floor of the Assembly to a vote, but when the Assembly's final vote was taken, the Parks Bill won at a vote of 74 to 21. Uh, one of the 21 against was Theodore Roosevelt. The bill then went to the desk of the governor for his signature or veto. Mayor Edson and city officials argued against his signing. Mullaly and his allies spoke to him directly and presented him with petitions with thousands of signatures in favor of his signing the bill. 
When Governor Grover Cleveland signed the bill on June 14, 1884, it became law. The process could now begin to purchase the land for the new cost from the owners. But this did not end the opposition to the establishment of mainland parks. The law required the city's parks department, the city's department of public parks, to apply at the next term of the Supreme Court for the appointment of commissioners of estimate. When the application was made, the city contended that the law was unconstitutional. The main contention was that the city had no right to take land in Westchester County in territory then beyond its boundaries. In this and in other legal disputes, Luther R. Marsh acted as counsel for the proponents of the new parks, and he did it without asking for any pro bono. After a hearing where counsel for both sides made their argument, the court announced unequivocally in favor of upholding the law. The city then appealed to the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York State. At the hearing arguments, the Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the Supreme Court. It stated that the city had a right to make improvements based upon future need as well as current need. It maintained that the commission and the legislature had determined that the land in nearby Westchester County would soon be encompassed within the city, and that this conclusion was reasonable. The Supreme Court then appointed three men to be commissioners of estimate, each of whom had supported the Parks Act. One of them was the lawyer Luther R. Marsh, who was subsequently voted the commission's chairman. They, in turn, appointed two surveyors. Yet the purchase of the new parks was further delayed in 1885 by businessman and reform Democrat, the new mayor, uh, William R. Grace. Grace contended that a new amendment to the state's constitution limiting the amount of bonds the city could issue made it impossible for the city to purchase the land for the new parks. The matter once again was decided by the Court of Appeals that ruled that the mayor had misread the intent and the letter of the new amendment. Mayor Grace then tried to get the parks bill of 1884 repealed and replaced by a more modest one. Mullaly and his allies marshaled their forces, and both houses of the legislature rejected Grace's proposal. In 1887, another assault on the Parks Act arose. This time, it came from the Westchester town of Pelham. About 80 residents of the town petitioned the Board of Alder for help in repealing the section of the Park Act relating to the establishment of Pelham Bay Park. They stated that the taking of the park by the city amounted to more than half of the land in the town, and that would increase the taxes paid by Pelham residents to a level they could not support. In reality, the assessed total taxes paid by all Pelham taxpayers who signed the petition was a paltry total sum of only $566.77. The city's Board of Aldermen refused to act on the matter. In the state legislature, the petition was denied on the grounds that the land already had been taken and condemned by New York City, even though legal title to the property had not yet passed by the, to the city. This effort was the last attempt made to prevent the establishment of parks on the mainland. What was Mullaly's vision for each of the new parks? Helen Bay Park. The largest amount of land taken for park purposes, the lady saw as the new port of the masses. Before the annexation of the other boroughs in 1898, Helen Bay Park would remain the only city park with, with an extensive waterfront. He saw thousands of middle class New Yorkers taking day trips by rail or boat to this new park. He projected outings by trade and benevolent associations and boating and yachting clubs. He saw people using Long Island Sound for swimming and fishing. He saw ample space for people to play baseball, tennis, and croquet. Mulaney also envisioned buildings on Hunter Island 
erected to house the slaves from all over the world, serving as a permanent industrial exhibition or World's Fair. And the construction of buildings for an aquarium and a zoo. In addition, he maintained that the isolated character of a large park prevented any artificial light penetrating the grounds from future nearby apartment houses, thus making the park a perfect place to erect an astronomical observatory. In the area that was to become Van Cortland Park, Hillary noted that Augustus Van Cortland already had allowed free use of his lake in winter for ice skating and playing the game of curling. Mullaley saw a vast level area of the park used by the New York City National Guard as a parade ground for military training. On days when it was not used for that purpose, the parade ground would be used for playing baseball, polo, lacrosse, and other games. Mullaley also saw many visitors coming to the park to see the historic sites, such as Bancroft the Mansion, Gold Hill, the Van Cortland Mill at the southern end of the lake, and Indian Field near Woodlawn. He waxed eloquent over the beautiful scenery formed by the large number of trees, the lake, and the varieties of birds and stones filled the air. Mullally considered Bronx Park, with the Bronx River running through it, lovely. He felt visitors would be fascinated with the boulder called the Rocking Stone. He saw the park's variety of color and light and shade attracting artists. He projected the northern portion of Bronze Park as a perfect site for a botanical garden. Mullaney described Cortona Park as occupying the eastern ridge of the Millbrook Valley, affording views ranging, at this, from the new Brooklyn Bridge to the Palisades. Uh, the site, formerly called the Batgate Woods, was filled with a wide variety of trees, meadows, glens, and springs. Moreover, the park was centrally located, and Mullaney foresaw it as the middle of a future vital, bustling urban neighborhood. Mullaney noted that St. Mary's Park was the smallest of the mainland parks taken by the city. Since it was closest to the Hall River, it already had the character of a urban park in 1888. Yet within its borders, it presented visitors with the varied beauties of wood and water, trees and shrubs, hill and valley, and rocks and meadows. The citizens of the old town of Marsania had intended it to become a park, and residents frequently used it as a park and for picnics. <coughs> Mullaney saw Claremont Park as a rural park cut off from the surrounding area because it is a valley lying between hills on the east and west. From the top of the hills, visitors could view the countryside and the valley below. Here could be found meadowlands, stately trees, and vine-covered rocks. Mullaley also envisioned the larger parks as connected by broad parkways. He saw them not only as places for a pleasant carriage ride, but as an extension of the parks themselves. He believed they would form triumphal entranceways to the great parks. He also insisted that the property values of the land along the parkways would increase to the benefit of the city. The route of Marshall Park connecting Van Cortlandt and Bronx Parks, then had several streams coursing through it, especially a brook running through most of its central portion. Mullaley initially believed the planting of trees along its borders was all that was needed, but he envisioned a much grander scheme that he admitted would lead to considerable expense. He felt, however, that such an effort was worth it. He saw the brook enlarged the dams, creating small lakes along the way, forming miniature waterfalls spanned by rustic bridges. Pelham Parkway, uh, connecting the Bronx and Pelham Bay Parks, ran across much more level ground, 
Eleni saw this parkway encompassing more than just two driveways, but also a bridle path for horseback riding and walks amid shrubs and grass. Eleni saw Cortona Parkway connecting Bronx and Cortona Parks mainly as promoting a rapid rise in real estate values along its route. Mulaney told the story behind the creation of these mainland parks and parkways in a book he wrote at the end of 1887 called New Parks Beyond the Harbor. He made clear the great benefit these parks would bring to the people of the city, not only then, but in the future. He was careful to credit many people in making this endeavor possible. Mm -hmm. Hold on for two and a half seconds. Big three. As a result of Mullaney's vision and his efforts, and the efforts of his allies, in 1888, the commission appointed to do the job purchased the total of 5,035.38 acres of parks and parkways on the mainland. Keep in mind that all of New York City up until that time had only 1,000 acres in parkland, mm -hmm none of which was in the Bronx. <laughs> uh, over the years, much of Mulaney's vision for these parks became reality. Other ideas of his were changed or modified. Still others never reached fruition. Through the years, there have been additions made to each of these parklands as the needs of these residents changed. Nevertheless, these parks still provide people with many different varieties of recreational opportunities. The abundant trees and plants emitting oxygen into the atmosphere still keeps the Bronx air fresh and provides lungs for the city. Moreover, these parks purchased in 1888 formed the foundation of the Bronx park system. Additional parkland has been added to the mainland through the years as a result, parkland occupies, as I said, 25% of today's Bronx. It all began with a vision and drive of an immigrant from Northern Ireland. It was for this reason that when land was acquired in 1924 to create a new park just north of the newly built Yankee Stadium, it was named Mulaney Park, to honor the father of the Bronx Park system. 